How fair do you think Mary Lincoln's insanity trial was, given the fact that Robert arranged it and picked her attorney? I think it was very fair. Under the law at the time, it was very fair. Um, <laughs> under the law, she was not required to have an attorney, but Robert picked one for her. Um, Isaac Arnold, you know, he did not want to be her attorney because he felt that she was insane. And that's when Leonard Sweat, you know, do your duties. She's going to go get some other lawyer and make us trouble, which has been taken to mean, oh, they're going to railroad her into the asylum. But the way that Sweat meant it was that everybody believes she's insane. She needs help. She, we cannot get her help unless the court finds her insane. But, um, you know, Robert he consulted all these doctors. Four of the doctors that testified had seen Mary Lincoln. That's a big misnomer that none of them had ever seen her before. They had actually seen her. Some of them had treated her. Um, so the whole trial has really been um, misrepresented in various books. It was very fair under the law at the time. Uh, I've always said this the, in Robert's favor before your book, when he was still the villain, that uh, he did get her out of there when he thought he could. It's not as if he put her away and, and threw away the key. Right. Uh, so I give him that. And uh, now that I'm on that for a second, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. uh, in Springfield, her uh, sister, was uh, unable to take her in. Mm -hmm. uh, she didn't want to take her in. Well, that too. <laughs> nor, did, nor did Robert and Mary Harlan Lincoln want to take her in. Right. They did for a little while and it didn't work out. Yep. I get, why couldn't they have someone stay with her? Did she prevent that? What was that? Robert actually hired a nurse uh, from the, the time that Tad died when Mary had to leave the Lincoln house because of the disagreement with her daughter-in-law. And that nurse stayed with Mary Lincoln from 1872 to 1875 as Mary traveled all over the U.S. going to health spas and spiritualist retreats. And why couldn't but, he keep her home with a nurse after that? Well, you know, Mary, you know, she had, as you said, from an aristocratic family, she had very uh, certain issues about what her servant could or could not tell her or help her to do. Mm -hmm. So even... In 75, when Mary was in Florida, really at the brink of, you know, she thought Robert was dying. She couldn't figure out what to do. Uh, the nurse telegraphed Robert, you know, Mrs. Lincoln needs to be home. But the nurse clearly could not convince Mary to do anything about it. So I think that, um, and as David Davis wrote, he said, you know, uh, most people with, with issues such as Mrs. Lincoln, it would be enough. You could probably convince them to get treatment. Mrs. Lincoln's temperament, as we all know, uh, that is not possible. So this going to trial under Illinois law was the only recourse we have because you can't reason with her. So. Ken, here is a uh, letter from Mary Lincoln, May 15th of 1865. Uh, this is during those six weeks that she holed up in the White House after the assassination. And I've been in uh, Andrew Johnson's Oval Office during that time, which is in uh, Treasury, overlooking the White House on the second floor there, and it, it has still retains the flavor of the day. You can just see him looking over and say, "When do I get in there?" And finally, have to kick her out. Here she is uh, in one of the very few letters she wrote during that time, although more than I expected. Uh, she only signed this one, trying to. Uh, she's recommending. Uh, one of the groundskeepers to the Secretary of the Treasury. Um, a difficult time for her, and certainly sent her further downhill. Did Abraham himself see anything of this in her, of you know the, the famous quote about Willie, you'll have to send you maybe over there to the asylum if you don't pull yourself together, but what about that early marriage and leading up to this time? Um, was there evidence that you saw of that quote, insanity, unquote, or did it come up uh, a bit, or how do you assess that during the, during the marriage, early marriage and up? If there was one turning point in the public's perception of Mary Lincoln, it came in 1866 when Abraham Lincoln's former law partner, William Herndon, delivered a series of four lectures in which, in the final lecture, he characterized their marriage as loveless and stormy and portrayed Mary Lincoln as a dysfunctional part of the Lincoln family. He and Mary went through a war of words that had Herndon calling her a wildcat and 
eventually Mary Lincoln labeling him a dirty dog. It got very ugly. That might have been forgotten, except that Herndon, as we know, collected over 400 letters after Lincoln's death, describing their marriage, looking at Lincoln's ancestry and his boyhood, gathering these reminiscences into what was really one of the first and possibly most important oral history projects in American history. He published a biography, others published biographies using those reminiscences. And as we all know, the person who tells the story first mm. has the most important voice. He told the story first. And that was the story that has haunted Mary Lincoln ever since her death. But Doug Wilson and uh, Rod Davis gathered those reminiscences. They published a wonderful edition of them. They're available online, Herndon's Informants. Mm -hmm. They're a wonderful resource for us. Without them, I could not have written my book. A large part of your book might not have been possible. Mm -hmm. We need to see the bias in those reminiscences, including Herndon's characterization of Mary Lincoln. And then they become very useful sources of evidence to us. We have reminiscences saying the opposite about Mary, the opposite extremes. Well, that could be evidence that she was a woman of extremes or that she was a divisive character, whereas Lincoln always tried to unite and compromise. Except for their first marriage. <laughs> for the first try at marriage where he went bolting and she couldn't understand why. You know, Herndon thought in that story about Ann Rutledge that Lincoln never got over. He, I love this. He thought he was helping Mary, that he was doing her a favor by bringing that story out. He said, you know, it's not her fault that their marriage was awful. It was because he never really loved her. It was really Ann Rutledge's fault for dying. So, you know, the story will come out. I might as well bring it out because I'm a family friend. Yeah. And it's, it's hilarious. When the first time it's I read that close. letter, I'm like, wow, you have some, some issues there, man. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, but then again, we here we're talking about Mary in, in these in these manners. Yet during her time in the White House, she did a lot of good as well. Thank you, and she and with Robert actually uh, went to many a hospital and tried to do a great deal of good for the soldiers and their families, and in a very spectacular way as well in in her own manner. Well, my favorite story: she even without the press. She essentially went undercover to the hospitals. My favorite story is she, to comfort a wounded soldier, offered to write a letter. Who would you like me to write to? To my parents. She sat, she wrote the letter. She visited him several times. She never identified herself. He recovered. He left the army. He went home. She had written the letter for him. Her parents brought it out. Here's that wonderful letter. And it was signed Mary Lincoln. And until that moment, he had no idea that it was the first lady sitting at his bedside, offering him solace and writing that letter for him. Mm -hmm. She also, well, Buchanan built a greenhouse in the White House. It was Mary Lincoln's favorite room. She loved flowers. And of course, that was one of the gender expectations that women will decorate a home. And of course, she had the White House to embellish and decorate and honor. She brought flowers personally to the hospitals, bouquets, and handed them out to the sick and wounded. When the women of Washington held a sanitary fair to raise funds for the medical care of the soldiers, she donated two bouquets that she arranged herself for auction. Each of them went for $50. That is over $1,000 a piece in currency today. So that was quite a contribution that she made. She, on her shopping trips to Philadelphia and New York, she also raised funds for the hospitals and donated that as well. 
And William Stoddard, the secretary, he made a great point. He said that was one of Mary's biggest mistakes, was that she did not publicize all these wonderful things she did. She didn't invite the press to come with her to the hospitals so that they could see this different, this magnanimous side of her, which, and I, and I agree, I think he was absolutely right. One, one of her servants was Elizabeth Cackley, her mm -hmm. seamstress, and born a slave, escaped slavery, raised a son who joined the Union Army and died for the war effort. Uh, they became close friends, confidants. Keckley became involved in the National Freemen's Relief Association, which was formed in Washington to help the fugitive slaves who were crowded into some pretty hideous contraband camps, as, as they were known. Mary Lincoln surreptitiously helped Cackley raise funds for the fugitive slaves. There's a, a, a letter in which she writes to her husband, please send $50 for the fugitive slaves. They are suffering. They need our help. He did. And again, that's over $1,000 in modern terms. This is about the inaugural address that was in the uh, in the satchel, right, that uh, was given by Lincoln. He was his inaugural address, the original, mm -hmm. and he put it into a satchel and on the train handed it to Robert and asked him to take care of it. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't know what was inside and uh, <laughs> put it behind uh, a counter, I'm telling your story. Uh, and, of course, that, that was a time that Robert later said that his father, when he finally retrieved it for him, uh, got pretty stern with him. Actually, uh, Ward Lamon is that a Is that a real story? That, that's true. Yeah, Robert, uh, yeah, he didn't know what was in it. When they got to the hotel, he gave it behind the counter. Uh, Lincoln couldn't find his son for, I think it was like two hours. Because whenever, every time they stopped, all the teenagers of the town would grab Robert and they'd ply him with wine and cigars and uh, just like all the, the adults took Abraham. And so when they finally found Robert, he said, where's my bag? Robert said, oh, I just gave it to the guy. So I, I love this visual of Abraham Lincoln running, leaping over the counter, you know, his pants probably up to his knees, digging. Of course, every bag was black, you know, so he's trying to find his black bag. And uh, when he found it, he thrust it at Robert. He said, now you take care of it. And uh, Robert actually wrote, he said, father did not scold. Actually, he never alluded to it again. But Ward Lamon's book, Ward Lamon said, I have never seen my, my you know, so complacent friend so incredibly angry. So I don't know. I believe Robert's version because, you know, Lamon, yeah, there's a lot of issues with his book and his reminiscences. So um, I'm sure I would assume Abraham was upset. <laughs> but yeah, I would think so too. What, what I like about that story is some parents would have taken the bag away yeah. and said, you can't be trusted with this. Lincoln gave it back. Good point. Yep. A it's second true. chance, forgiveness, compassion. True. A learning experience for Robert. And Robert said, uh, yeah, when for all of us. Father said, "You take care of it." Robert wrote, "You bet I did!" Exclamation <laughs> point. So. <laughs>